I didn't think I needed to compound um, or shed any negative light on Mike Anderson by having a press conference after I let him go. Um, I didn't see the point in that. The only thing that was going to come on that was um, negative things towards Mike and how he ran his program. And I made a decision that was difficult. Um, and so I hope you guys understand why I didn't have a press conference um, after that. And this is the first time collectively together we've been through a search process. And um, I don't know how my predecessor um, ran his searches, but um, I ran my searches in a very close-knit circle. There were many of my senior administrators that were not included um, in the searches. We did not use a search firm. Um, I feel like it's my role as a director of athletics to be able to identify um, who is a great fit for our programs here at the University of Arkansas, and, and that's how I did that. And I know uh, by doing so, uh, that led to a lot of misunderstanding of, of information that may have been put out there by agents or other coaches or sometimes self-serving interest um, along the way. But um, I want you guys to know that it was first and foremost what I wanted to do is run a search uh, of the utmost integrity. And as John and I went through this process together, I asked him several times as we were traveling together, because it's very important to me, John, have I done anything to compromise my integrity during this search? And every time John answered me, it was no, and that was very important uh, to me. But so I appreciate what you guys do and the job that you do, um, and now I'll open that up for questions. If you have questions, uh, Trey? Hunter, how do you how do you start on a process like this? Where does your where does your pool come from? Is it just past experiences? What's the start point to a coaching staff? Sure. Um, you know, especially in a sport like basketball that I played basketball and I've been around it and I watch it and I consume it and it's a passion that I have. Um, I watch other programs around the country and um, take notes of, of coaches that I think are doing special things and may be a fit um, at the institution that I'm at, which is currently the, the University of Arkansas. And then you take that list of people I have an interest in and you have to find if they have an interest in, in your position. And so that's kind of that first phase. And then to the point where there is a mutual interest in the position and you kind of move it to that next course like where I made an initial phone call uh, to Coach Musselman and then there's a, a visit and I like to go visit coaches uh, quite candidly in their homes with their families because I think you learn a lot about coaches and if they're fit for what I'm looking for for our department. I mean, you hear me talk a lot about family and one Razorback and um, you know, I want coaches that first of all want to be here and that uh, I think fit with our other 14 or 15 head coaches. And then uh, from that, um, you know, you, you've got to call some people that have worked with them, whether that's a director of athletics, whether that's a head coach at an institution, someone that knows uh, about them and, and how they work um, at their particular institution. And you kind of, that helps you kind of narrow that field and shrink that field down to, to one or two that you really zero in on. Well, hey, Hunter, I guess a, a player meeting was at, was at your house. What's that? The, the, the player meeting. Was yeah, we, yeah, we had a cookout at my house last night. I thought rather than the the usual locker room meeting where the coach meets his lock in the locker room, we just had a cookout at my house, and I thought that was a kind of an easy kind of breaking the ice way for um, the guys to meet their head coach. I've got a pool table, I've got a ping pong table, I've got some cornhole courts. Mm -hmm. You know, they're watching WrestleMania, they're playing video games, and I thought that was just a neat way. Uh, for those guys to relax a little bit and not be in the locker room where they're all kind of tense and um, a great opportunity for them to meet their new head coach. You know, players, they, they've been in a lot of frustration on social media when, when you let Mike go and seemed pretty upset, but seeing them today, they looked pretty happy. They looked happy on the video. Where do you think the players are? How do you think that meeting went? What do you think when, when Eric said, there's enough talent in here right now to go to the NC tour. Were you kind of like, hey, don't say that, or what, what was your feeling? You know? <laughs> I mean, as an athletic director, I love that. I mean, what he talked about during the interview process was setting goals for your team and talking about those goals. And you know, simple things like the code to the locker room is the first is selection Sunday, the date of that. And so the guys are always constantly thinking about what that goal is. And so I've got no problem with a coach setting a goal like that. And and you know, in his first day on the job, really um, putting that goal out there. And how'd you think the players? They they were upset, but you know they're they're young. They they get sure. over stuff. How, how, how do you think they're doing? I think they're doing great. We you know after Coach Anderson had met with them roughly two weeks ago, I followed it up with my own meeting to talk to them, and, and um, you know I allowed them to throw whatever daggers they wanted at me, um, quite candidly in, in the locker room, and they were very few thrown. Um, obviously, those players all cared for Coach Anderson, and he was the one. Uh, one of the reasons they were here at the University of Arkansas, so that, that change was tough. But what I can tell you is last week, 
Uh, they went over to the basketball practice facility after the week off. Most of those guys were in there working out. They were lifting weights. They were on the gun shooting. They were playing uh, five on five. And so I think that speaks volumes of, you know, they want um, to, to be taken to the next level. And so they were preparing for the new coach. And so I think their attitude, um, you know, obviously when the coach first walked in last night, they're all kind of quiet and stoic. But after they went upstairs and got their meal and were sitting around with coach talking, um, and he went down there and was very intentional about his conversations with them. I thought it went really, really well. Otis, uh, how much Coach Musselman, his NBA experience being a head coach and stuff, and how much did that play in the decision to hire him? I mean, what fact, did that factor in quite a bit? I don't know if it's necessary as NBA experience, but uh, his experience at all levels and the fact that he'd been successful at all levels. It, you know, you might look at his record at Golden State and say, well, he had a losing record, but he also looked like he was the runner-up for the NBA Coach of the Year in his first season at Golden State, uh, where he really flipped that program around. And so he's been successful at all levels. But here at the University of Arkansas in the Southeastern Conference, you want to recruit the elite players that want to play at that next level. And I think what he can prepare them for is that next level, whereas he talked about whether that's Europe or that's the, the G League or the D League, whatever they call that league now, and um, the NBA. And um, he can tell them, here's the path, and here's how you get there. Right, Josh. I know you were very forthright there just about the process. You said you wanted to make sure that you, you fully vetted, that you talked to a number of different people. How important was that to you to talk to a few different people instead of kind of deciding on one person and really moving down that path? Sure. I, I think you have to compare. When you're doing a search, I think you have to compare coaches. I don't know how you say who's the best coach if you just zero in on one and you don't compare coaches to other coaches in the industry and uh, talk to them about their philosophies and make sure they're a great fit. And so that was important to vet a number of candidates before we made the final selection. All right, Trey. Hunter, was there a moment where, whether it was in the interview or later, and I don't mean just like when you offered the job to him or decided to tell everybody that you're offering the job to him, was there a moment where you said, I think this is the guy? And what, and what moment was that? It was the moment I offered it to him on the phone on Friday, and he about, uh, my ear was shaking. He was yelling so loud, he was so excited. <laughs> You know, and that's what you want when you offer somebody a job. And he was about ready to jump through the phone if he could have. He was so excited uh, that he had been offered the opportunity to be our head basketball coach. And, and, and right then and there, um, obviously I had made a decision I thought was the right decision, but when you call a coach and you offer him a position and he has that level of excitement and Danielle's in the background and she's yelling and screaming too, um, you know it's the right decision. Yeah. With the social media usage by Chad Morris and the success he's had winning that, and with Eric Musselman, we've talked about that. How much of that, you know, portraying the university that way and embracing that plays into the hire? I mean, is it a big percentage? Is it part of it? See, that, the, I would say that was a minute percentage of that, that social media. I mean, that's, uh, you know, coaches are dependent on that and, and that taking the brand that we have at the University of Arkansas and using that in the recruiting process through social media because that's what young men, uh, that's how they're being engaged and that's how they're communicating with. And so coach understands that and the use of social media and how that helps them in the recruiting process in the same way that Chad Morris and his staff do. Listen. Hunter, question. Yes. You mentioned the SEC and the landscape now with the coaches and the quality of coaches this league has, and then Buzz, uh, you know, Williams is at Texas A&M. Musselman fitting in and being competitive in a league right now that's really, really building their basketball program. It is very important. I mean, I think it's uh, the experience he's had at all levels, you know, coaching elite athletes and the connections he has. I mean, I think one of the first phone calls he got uh, yesterday when, when this became official was from Coach Calafari, and I think that shows the respect he has from coaches around the country that, um, you know, he, he said Coach Calafari was welcoming him to the league, and he says, you know, I'm coming after him, so I don't know how much he's going to welcome me, in, in, you know, when we get on the court with him. Okay, Bob? Hunter, how many guys did you talk to about this job? I mean, formal interviews and maybe even casually, guys expressing interest. How, how many guys did you actually talk to about the job? As we got to, we really shrunk and pulled down from, I would say, a dozen to about four or five that we really zeroed in on. And then what was it that week like? I mean, for you, you obviously, I guess, want to check with some other guys. We were always feeling like, hey, Eric, I think he's the guy, but I want to make sure. Or what was that week like or whatever? Sure. That, I mean, that was what the week was like. I mean, just uh, comparing um, each of the candidates that we wanted to, to interview. And um, you've got coaches that are somewhat in the, in the midst of seasons that you may want to have a conversation with. And, you know, I'm very adamant in how I run searches that I'm not going to talk to a coach when they're still competing, when they have student athletes. That should be their focus. And I think... Um, 
um, that's a bad way to run a search if you try to connect with coaches and take their distraction away from the student athletes and, and, and what they're trying to accomplish at their current institution. Clay? Just watching, did you, did you watch tape? Did you watch, uh, ask for tape of Nevada? Had you seen a number of their games? And what did you think if, if you did, what, what you saw? I watched, uh, I don't know that I watched tape. Um, I was able to pull up uh, some highlights of the game in which they played against Florida. Um, and they weren't very good um, early in that game. And then I think they um, took Florida out of their comfort zone and started to speed that game up. I think we all know Florida likes to play really, really slow. Um, and they were able to slow Nevada down early. And then Nevada was able to flip that and almost came back and, and won that game. And so that was a game I paid particular attention to. Huh? And Hunter, what ultimately was your reason in deciding to, to change coaches here? I think we, we did not have the level of success. Um, we had success, but we didn't have the level of success I believe we could have here at the University of Arkansas. And that was reaffirmed again. I said this earlier. When, when I talked to other coaches around the country, whether they had an interest in this job or not, or they were calling to talk about another candidate in the pool, um, it was always that this is a top tier SEC job. This should be a top two or three, uh, a, a team that's in the top two or three in the SEC year in and year out, and one that's in the top 20 year in and year out. And um, that we hadn't met that uh, consistently over the past eight years. Dave? Just can, since uh, Eric doesn't have any ties to Arkansas, how much are you going to try? I know he's got a lot to do, but try to get him around the state this summer with retroactive meetings and that kind of thing. Well, he'll start tackling that, and uh, him and Coach Morris are heading over to Little Rock together on uh, Wednesday uh, for an event. So we're already starting to get him out and about across the state, and our external team and our Razorback Foundation team, they're already putting together a schedule. That's very important to get him. Um, around the state. It's, he understands the importance of him and his staff being in the high schools across the state as well. So it's kind of a two-fold. He's got the recruiting piece where he needs to get out uh, and around the state with him and his staff, get him into the high schools. And of course, we want to get him um, out and around the state and engage with our various constituents uh, from all corners of this state. Scott? Hey, Coach, I guess just looking back, kind of an overview of, of Musselman's uh, past teams, what were some of the kind of the defining qualities that his teams had that intrigued you? I think the first of all that they, they he talked about it they, they play hard for the entire game um, you know I remember a game a, a few years ago I think they were playing Cincinnati in the tournament and I think Cincinnati may have been up by 20 some points in that game and they, they came back in that game I think they ended up winning that game and this is they play hard throughout um, there's not you know they may not play great throughout but they're always playing hard and I think um, that you know you look at um, I think Nevada had 24 wins in the two seasons prior to Coach Musselman's arrival. They haven't won less than 24 games in the four seasons since he's been there. And I think uh, that's a testament to him changing the culture uh, of that program um, and the fact that what he instills in them. And I, I think just the, how they played and played hard throughout was one of the things that st stuck, out, stuck out in my mind. Right. Well, we have Bobby has another question. That's okay. We'll go Matt Jones and then we'll finish well, no, Bob, up. Bob got his hand up. Well, well he's our closer. <laughs> Matt, you go. He's been worked five days in a row. That's right. We'll go Matt first. At what point did you make your decision on buying him? Was there anything in your exit, your, your end season meeting with him that you could have said or done for him to be allowed to come back for another year? I mean, uh, Mike and I met um, on Monday after the season was over. We played at Indiana on um, Saturday. Saturday, and then um, he had a kind of a list of things that I wanted to talk about on Monday that were delivered to him. Um, and then we met, I think, you know, some attended at the Blessings, saw that we met um, at the Blessings, and that was an attorney that was actually John Fagg that was in that meeting, um, <laughs> as well as our basketball sport administrator. Um, and. I think just uh, a little bit more of a vision for our program moving forward uh, may have helped. And, and quite honestly, I did not make my decision until I laid my head on the pillow uh, that Monday night. Uh, it was a, as I said, it was an extremely hard decision. I mean, as an athletic director, uh, you let a coach go that's never had a losing season that was so closely tied uh, to this program and the history that he had here with Coach Richardson and the great man that he was and, and all he stood for. And I, I told him the day I let him go, that this is the hardest thing I've ever had to do, Mike, because um, you and I stand for so many of the same values in our lives and, and what we want um, to happen to the, for these young men. 
off the basketball court. Um, but ultimately, what happens on the basketball court is, is as an athletic director, um, how I have to evaluate um, our program moving forward. When, when, when you let him go, was it like face-to-face -face in his office or your office? Or? It was face-to-face -face in my office. Yeah. And as you would imagine, uh, Mike handled it with the utmost class. Yeah, I saw, did you see the video he put out? I, I did. What did what, you think of that? I, I think it's, it's Mike Anderson. He's first class. They got a little lighter, happier. What, what kind of dog did your wife do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got another uh, golden doodle. So now we have a 10-year-old golden doodle and a 10-week-old golden doodle. It is awesome. <laughs> Does the young dog bother the old dog? Oh, yeah. The, the, the young dog likes to nip at the old dog's ears. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Yeah.